So hello to everyone. Uh, Fabio Tacconi from Brussels again for the ISM chat. And I have the pleasure today to welcome Marcus Skrifars from Helsinki. Marcus is professor of emergency medicine, well-known experienced intensivist, and I have big pleasure to welcome him today. Hello, Marcus. Hello. Uh, so we will discuss today about the topic that you like, I know. Uh, it's a post-resuscitation care, in particular in the light of the recently ERC ASIC guidelines. So the first burning question for you, where do we stand about coronary angio in cardiac arrest admitted patients? So uh, that's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, the evidence for coronary angiography was very thoroughly evaluated for these guidelines. So there was a systematic review that went through all the evidence. And uh, uh, in, in brief, ST elevation myocardial infarction, not much data in your cardiac arrest patients, but since the data is so convincing in your non-cardiac arrest patients, uh, we definitely recommend uh, these patients to have angiography because it's so much more efficient than, than thrombolysis or whatever. And I wouldn't think that nobody would consider not treating uh, an, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Then for the non-ST elevation, uh, which is of course, as a diagnosis, very tricky, because if you have somebody in cardiac arrest, you can't ask them about chest pain. You might have elevated troponin anyway because of your cardiac arrest. Uh, so there, I, I think uh, angiography for all, now the evidence, the studies, the one large study from, from Holland by Lemkes and colleagues, should show that we don't need to, uh, to do angiography at all. And the problem is that the, uh, that many of the patients where you, if you do it to everybody, you, you have quite a lot of uh, false negative ones. With, so patients without any findings. So I think the trick would be to, to try to really uh, use some other means uh, and make a, a clear picture. Does this patient have a high likelihood of uh, having uh, a coronary lesion that we need to open up? So these would be do an echo look at the troponin, take a very good history from the relatives perhaps. Uh, uh, and, and then if you, th or, or if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then consider angiography. And if that's not the case, then you may uh, take the patient to the ICU, uh, treat them and then uh, take it from there. Very clear, Marcus. So as we were into the hemodynamics, let's say cardiac issues, I have a second question that I know is very relevant that you like too. What about hemodynamic targets? The old guidelines said that we should target, you know, as usual, 65 millimeters of mercury, yeah. at least yeah. the magic number. Yeah. Which is your point of view also in light of these, uh, these guidelines? Mm. So the, the number 65 to 70 millimeters of mercury. So, so there's quite good observational data suggesting that that probably is the, the sweet point for, for, for MAP targets. There's several different studies and they all point in the same direction. Uh, of course, it would be, given that it would be quite tricky to, for example, randomize to, a, to an even lower target. So that would be very difficult to do. But of course, the key question is, should we target higher pressures in some patients? And there are two pilot studies that have looked at this. There's the Comacare trial from, from Helsinki uh, and, and Finland. Uh, and then there's the Neuroprotect trial from Belgium. And both these trials sort of, I must say, in a way failed to show that, uh, that a higher target would be uh, needed in, in, in your general uh, cardiac arrest patient. There might be subgroups and, and there's definitely a need for, for future, future trials uh, on this, but at the moment, the evidence is for 65 to 70 millimeters mercury. Can I just one point which I, I would uh, definitely want to stress is that the vasopressor of choice, I think, in these patients is noradrenaline. It has a very favorable profile, increases pressures without causing tachycardia and arrhythmias. I have just a question for you, uh, just looking also data from Canada. Of course, in patients who suffer from cardiac arrest of respiratory origin, and they show this uh, quite elevated ICP needed for high pressure, are we maybe going in the future as, uh, you know, post-anoxic injury is a form of brain injury and we use higher target of blood pressure in these patients. Would you say that if well tolerated, we might 
accept these higher MAP uh, targets in these cardiac arrest patients? Uh, I think that's a great point you're making. And, and the whole problem, of course, with these guidelines is that we're trying to make you know, one goal for all patients. And we, that, that probably isn't the right thing to do. So I think there's definitely a view to further look into perhaps in some of these cases, cases perhaps you know, do a CT brain, is there signs of early cerebral edema? And if that's the case, perhaps uh, use a higher MAP target. And, and the other group would then be you know, patient with chronic hypertension. That's definitely a group where the observational data suggests that perhaps a higher target would, would benefit the patient. Um, if I move to the gas analysis, there are a lot of discussion on oxygen and CO2. So very practically, are we afraid more of hypoxemia or more on hyperoxia? Are we afraid more of apocapnia or hypercapnia? Or there are all just the is for the brain. So I think, as we say in the guidelines, what we would aim for oxygen would be a normoxia. So an oxygen between 10 to 12 kilopascals. And for carbon dioxide, normal capnia, so 4.5 to 6. So we start by oxygen. I think that the uh, most evidence suggests that hypoxia is harmful. So there's really no role for hypoxia. So we should avoid that. Then when it comes to hyperoxia, it's very tricky, the evidence. And, and, and you know that the, the Australian ICU rock study, they, they showed an indication that, that you know, a very strict uh, oxygen target would benefit cardiac arrest patients. But then the recent Danish uh, hot ICU study basically showed the complete opposite. So, so my interpretation is that if there is uh, something there, it, it's probably not that massive. It's not that great an effect, uh, but definitely, you know, your strict, your very high hyperoxia, you know, prolonged use of 100% oxygen without checking a blood gas, that's, that's not a good idea. So, so strict, uh, very high oxygen value, values, say an oxygen of 30, 40 kilopascal, uh, there's no evidence at all that that would be helpful. So I would avoid that. What about CO2? So with carbon dioxide, Again, it's very, it's very murky, and, and we, of course, need the, the larger trials. And, and you, you're well aware of the TAME trial where uh, there's a, the, 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 they're evaluating a sort of mild hypercapnia, so targeting around 7 kilopascals to, to normal capnia, and that trial is running. There's some pilot data suggesting that it's, uh, that it's perhaps uh, uh, good, and there's also some animal data uh, but it's not that clear. So definitely we need uh, the definitive di di data on that. And until then, I would uh, target normal capnia. And of course, the other question is that hyper, uh, hypocapnia, so ventilating the patient too much, that is quite common. So my advice would be that, especially during the first, say, six to eight hours in the ICU, take a lot of blood gases. Uh, I think it's a cheap test. So it's very useful to, to take lots of them to make sure that the, when the patient stabilizes that you're not hyperventilating the patient. Very clear, Marcus. Um, if we consider neuroprotection, of course, TTM2 will become soon. So we'll have some responses about hypothermia. Now, do you think that, that there should be in the future some place for other neuroprotectant, either drugs or strategies in these patients? So, so that's a that's a very very good point. Uh, in terms of drugs, uh, you know, xenon that has been evaluated in in, in a smaller pilot study um, uh, conducted actually in Finland. Uh, there was a signal towards a decrease in brain injury, but of course the the phase three trial is needed, which unfortunately, as far as I've heard, is on hold because of problems with funding. Uh, but xenon is a an, an interesting uh, neuroprotective agent. Uh, then there's animal studies on argon. That's the other option. And there's also studies going on, for example, on, on, on a comparison of your overall sedation strategy. So basically, we, we don't need to really know whether propofol is the ideal way to sedate these patients. And perhaps uh, sevoflurane could be an option. But again, uh, we need trials on this. Then with regards to other neuroprotective agents, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the study on erythropoietin and cyclosporin. 
both had very nice experimental data, but then again, uh, the, the clinical data didn't really come through to, to support uh, any, any use. So, so um, really, really not much that happening soon, I think. Very, 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 very good, Marcus. I have a last question for you. The one of the you know, last part of the guidelines, of course, focus on the after or immediately after the injury, how to prognosticate these patients. Could you tell our listeners which are the major changes in terms of neuroprognostication guidelines in this setting? So in essence, nothing much. Uh, there's no major changes. So, so basically the algorithm is, is quite the same as it was. The good thing is that we now have good, better data actually telling us that the algorithm works. So uh, in, in, in a nutshell, start obtaining information early on about how the patient is doing. Uh, get a history, do a uh, four score, evaluate the pupils uh, and so forth uh, during ICU care. If the patient has seizure-like activity, obtain an EEG, get your biomarker, NSC 24, 48 hours, uh, but then don't decide until you rewarm the patient and make sure that all the sedative agents have disappeared from the patient. Then, if they're still deeply unconscious, by using the algorithm, by getting at least two different signs suggesting that this patient is likely to have a poor outcome, then you can consider withdrawing care. Of course, liaising with the family. Marcus, I really want to thank you because you summarized very elegantly in a few minutes the major points that have been uh, pointed out in the new guidelines. Uh, this will, of course, highlight many discussions in the next uh, months. We, will, of course, expect uh, big studies to be published in this setting and to still help us to better understand how to manage our patients. So thanks for being with us and hope to see you soon in our chat or in the next meeting. Many thanks. It was my pleasure. Thank you.